Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be here this morning. Great to see so many people who's chosen to come up the hill and be here with us this morning. I, I've got to do some bragging at the very front. Um, not about me, but about this church. And I'll do that in just a second. Don't forget, next week is back to school bash in the evening. I, I want to encourage you all to be here in the evening, but I want you to also be here in the morning. The same speaker is going to be here in the morning. And, and the, the verdict already been rendered. This guy is tremendous. He's the president of Freed Hardeman, but he's been preaching for years. And he's been on the circuit of young people for a long time. You're going to find him refreshing and enjoyable. And uh, you're going to love him in the morning and you're going to want to come back that night. Uh, I'll say that. But now, you know, we've said that about Back to School Bash in the, in the past and, and everybody's like, yeah, you've built that up and it wasn't real. I just give it a shot. Come here next Sunday. Invite a friend. Invite a neighbor and be here and just... Michael can vouch for it. I'll vouch for it. Anybody who's heard David Shannon will, will, will also vouch for it. I just promise, give us a shot. Be here, and you'll be here next Sunday night, and hopefully other youth groups as well. So remember that. I, I want to say this to Hollis, who uh, I don't know if you saw fa Facebook, but she had a birthday party, and all that money is going to make a wish, which I think is an amazing thing. She's got a 150 bucks or something like that, and I just admire when young people do that. So I'll brag about that till, until kingdom come. Graydon came up to me two weeks ago with a piece of paper with a bunch of circles on it and I looked at it and he looked at me and I looked at it and I looked at him and I couldn't figure he said you said Jesus or God 78 times in the sermon today I guess that's how he fends off boredom or something that's fine hey anything that works right that means I think that means you preached an hour and 20 minutes I think it's what he's saying but I admire that and I, I, I got to say this there was a group that went to Laboner this week and served a meal there and also got to visit with the Leeds for a while that was an amazing experience I'll never forget and the privilege of being present with them and I, I, I want to say this also this is a praying congregation last week we admitted our weakness and our difficulty understanding why God is is allowing so much weird stuff to happen to Maya but we had picture a moment ago that she's holding him right now and everything is going well but hey, listen we've been here before and I got to tell you there's a group of ladies here young women who are are prayer warriors when you get something going for them that they, they are going to God and I, I even had a prayer one time during the course of this God you want to get these women off your back let's just heal this boy God you want to get these women I can't imagine much of women coming on behalf of something but I, I they, they are dogged and determined and this is a prayer warrior congregation and we believe in it and anybody who has been here and, and watch what happens and doesn't believe in prayer you I don't know what to do with you uh, because there have been so many times during this Maya episode where the machines are working, the medicines are working, the best doctors are on it, but there's a gap between what they can do and what's needed. And who fills that? Who governs the rest of it and fills that? And, and what we do is we go to God in prayer in that gap and in many other places, and we ask him for something, and God is responding, and there's no other explanation I can think of than the fact that God is working in this and that we need to continue with it. I also know, and the Whitley's still struggling with, with the issue the, uh, of the loss of Veda. You see it, you know it. They are in Branson right now, so they're not with us. But I know right now they're really struggling, so we're going to have a prayer for these families. And here's what I want you to do. This is not Pentecostal. This is just biblical, okay? There was a time when Moses had to lift up his hands, and when he couldn't lift up his hands, two people helped him hold his hands up. These families need their hands held up. They need some somebody to help them during this time it's wearisome if you ever been in a hospital like that for a week and a few days like they are right now they're worn out I want you to hold up your hands like this with me you don't have to hold them way up because that gets Pentecostal let's get down here <laughs> let's just hold up your hands and I want you we're gonna pray together and we're gonna hold up these families this morning through this prayer and we're just gonna let them know we're with them so keep your hands held up the entire time of this prayer you ready Father, we come before you and we know without a shadow of a doubt that you are hearing what we're saying and that you're going to do something. And we come seeking, we come asking, we come knocking. And we're going to keep doing this because these families have things that we can't just pray for once and be done with it and move on with life as before because life is never as it was before, not for the Whitleys now. 
and not for the swindles who every day they wake up with this empty void that they don't know what to do with and it's struggle they struggle they struggle as anyone would and father we don't know what to do with them so for them sometimes we don't even want to say in our prayers after after weeks of, of praying to you but God what we do is we come before you we want you to see our hands lifted up we want to lift up their hands we know they're not with us right now but we know you are with us and with them and we ask that you lift up their hands and that you give them some relief that you give them some peace and every day just a little more and a little more that they don't forget that they don't leave behind Veda's memory none, none of that but that they can find joy again and they can have peace in their lives and they can live and they can relate to one another and I pray especially for Justin and Abby because it takes a toll on a marriage we know that and we pray father you keep them bonded together and help every prayer that's said by any of us to be something that lifts up their hands. If right now we're praying for the least, we're getting good news more and more every day, and we're grateful. We know it's you, God, and we say to you, thank you. We thank you because we came to you last Sunday begging you to do something. You've done something. We want to give thanks where thanks is due. We want to say thank you for, for this. But we also want to know, Father, this is not over. This is still ongoing, and we don't want to let up this guard at all. And they're tired. They're weary. They're fatigued. They've been standing or sitting in a, in a hospital for so long don't want to leave his side and God they're worn out and we want you to give the strength that we've got in our hands to them give our strength to them so that out of nowhere they get encouragement and blessing and strength we know where it comes from and we ask you to do the transferring watch over our family members who are hurting others who maybe we're not aware of right now Martha Rampy tomorrow goes for some more chemo give her some strength from us God send it through this prayer we pray in Jesus name Amen. Thank you. We are in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So we've come to have expectations, maybe partly from tradition, about the way a sermon is supposed to end. You have to dress up for a wedding on a Saturday afternoon, mess up your whole day to dress up for this occasion, and what you're waiting for is you may kiss the bride. That means I can now have a piece of cake and go home. Or maybe maybe you're watching Looney Tunes and you watch this show and you like it, but then it, what tells you that it's over? That's all, folks, right? You've got this signal that this thing is coming to an end. What? How does a sermon end? How are you supposed to know when freedom is now returned to you what's the trigger that when you hear it you reach for the songbook and that's so yesterday that's not what we do we got the powerpoint now so you look for the kids in the corners of the pews you gather up the toys and put them in the bag and you put your purse on your shoulder and you're just waiting you're waiting for your freedom to return right you just know we're a closing prayer away unless the Knicks are leading and then you got another verse of a song but then but then you you, you know what the you know what the, the cues are right you know what it is the triggers that say Hey, it's over. It's done. For old timers in Churches of Christ especially, you expect an invitation. You expect a sermon to end no matter what the topic was. It's got to end with a plan of salvation and an emotional appeal to act on it. I don't understand this, but I I've been raised this way and I've, I've got elders. I used to have an elder, one in particular, who'd come up to me and he was always irritated with the way the sermon ended. You didn't make the right appeal. You should stir my emotions and that's where I should feel this deep stirring and that's where I first got an animosity to the whole deep stirring thing it's because of this expectation the sermons always got to end that way or, or maybe you're one of those that the sermon has to review what everything that we've gone over you 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 may have been taught this way you tell them what you're gonna tell them you tell them and then you tell them what you told them are you that dense really I mean come on I know what you're doing I don't have to listen to anything but that last little summary and then I can spit it out to you and convince you I listen Listen to the whole thing. That's a terrible ending. How are sermons supposed to end? 
Well, let's look at Scripture, but you look at Scripture, it doesn't help you because most sermons never ended. Now, I don't mean they're never-ending sermons. I mean, you look at the book of Acts, and every sermon is interrupted. Every sermon has the audience interrupt and end the sermon. Even Acts 2.38, our favorite go-to passage, he's, Peter's not done yet. He's still going in for the kill, and the people say, that's enough, that's enough, we want to know what to do. And he answers the question, and it's over. And Paul does this constantly in the book of Acts. So if we're going to do this biblically, you need to interrupt the sermon and bring everything to an end. <laughs> yeah, what do we, yeah, here he goes. <laughs> smart Alex. Too many smart Alex about of you. But instead, we've come up with other traditions about how it's supposed to end. And yet, we look at Jesus. This is the sermon par excellence of all, right? And here we should watch the master work. Here's his invitation. Enter through the narrow gate. Verse 13. The great Sermon on the Mount where he's talked about so many monumental things and everybody makes reference to it. And he ends with, you got to come through. You need to enter the narrow gate. There's no summary here. There's no going back through everything and reviewing again. None of that. There's no emotional appeal at all. You're not going to feel compelled to respond to this in droves. We're not going to have a bunch of people come down the aisle like an old Jimmy Allen gospel meeting. None of them. Jesus is not very good evangelistic preacher here because he says, I'm going to tell you, guys, come on into the narrow gate. Let me tell you, I'm going to paint a picture of what will happen if you do this. And this picture is not pleasant. First of all, I want you to know if you come in this narrow gate, you've also got to walk a narrow narrow road. The gate and the way are narrow. It's a tight fit. You can't bring all your friends with you. You can't bring all your stuff with you. It's a narrow fit. You're at Six Flags or you're at a Cardinal ball game and you've got these masses of people waiting to get in and yet everybody has to filter in through one turnstile, all right? We've got we to figure out how to get narrow enough to go in this turnstile. But then on the other side of the turnstile, you can go back into the crowd mentality. And there's a lot of people in our world that say, I'll tell you what, I'll narrow, I'll bow my knee, and I'll say Jesus is Lord in front of a group of people, and, and I'll go through that narrow gate, and then everything will be just like it was before. I'll continue living just like I was before because the road widens out, right? No. Not according to Jesus, the narrow gate leads to the narrow way. It stays narrow the entire time. Do you know what narrow means? It's one of the worst insults you can be given in a postmodern world. Narrow-mindedness. We want all our op options open. We want every conceivable alternative made available to us. Our imagination is the limit to what we can do. If I have certain needs or desires, I want every possible scenario available to me. And Jesus says to us, if you choose the narrow gate and the narrow way, your options shrink considerably. It's narrow. The other option that most people are choosing by even not even being here is a huge eight-lane highway that's paved, and you can do anything you want to. There's all sorts of alternative lifestyles. There's all sorts of choices they have on this road, and they can do whatever they want. They've got the freedom to do and explore and practice their individuality all over here. But Jesus says, not so with a narrow way. In essence, it's God's way or the highway. I think maybe that's where this phrase came from. The origin of my way or the highway. God is the first one to say it. And it's, it sounds just so crude. It sounds so limiting and constricting. And that's what the narrow road is. There's a couple of things you need to know about this. You will not have as many options to consider as other people do in the world. It's like they've got this endless buffet of options. They can choose what they want to. Anymore, I can choose the gender I am. I can choose the identity I want to have. I can choose however I want to respond in anger or in lust or in greed. I can do any number of things. And the narrow way takes some of those options off the table completely. When you become a Christian, you are restricted by revelation. And that narrows your options considerably. This is why so many people refuse it. This is why those old gospel altar calls we used to have and all these people came forward. Nobody wants to come forward. That's not what I want. 
you'll never be in the majority either as far as I can tell in this passage. He says there's a lot of people go down that highway, but not a lot of people choose this narrow road. You give up the popularity track, and it's a lonely road sometimes. And I feel for our young people especially, and every one of us feels this in our heart, and I hear prayers for the young people a lot, and here's why. It's never been more difficult ever to walk a narrow road in the wide hallways of our school as it is right now. And our desperate desire for them to sense us, uh, be, have a sense of belonging and maybe even acceptance and popularity. How in the world can a Christian walking the narrow road in the hallways of our schools, if they're really faithful to the truth of the narrow road, be popular? God's people have always struggled with this. Here's a pop question. Why did they even want a king? Does anybody remember? Why did the Israelites want a king? We want to be like everybody else. God's people have always struggled with this. Can I have the narrow road benefits without the narrow road restrictions? No. I hate to say it like that. New Testament, you go to letters of Corinth, every one of the letters in the New Testament was written for the same reason. The church was becoming more like the culture than they were the church. Because we're always prone to want to be and participate in our culture as fully as possible. But the narrow road won't allow that. And this is always going to be a struggle for us. This is the reality. Do you see why nobody wants to come forward? Do you see why I look at Jesus and say, that's not going to get a bunch of responses? I guess he insists on telling the truth. And then he goes on to say something else. It's not just about the narrowing of your options. It's also about the evaluating of people around you. There's going to be false prophets come to you. There's going to be people who look like spiritual authorities in your life. It can be a preacher. It can be an elder. It can be a teacher in your Bible classes. It can be somebody who writes a good book that everybody's reading or a great song on K-Love or any number of things. It can be someone who, who is set up as a spiritual influence, but you don't have the right to just take it hook, line, and sinker because appearances are deceiving these false prophets are actually wolves in sheep's clothing and the only way that you can do this the only way you can practice the narrow road with people is that you've got to constantly practice discernment with every influence in your life because these sheep look like sheep but they're bad that sounds a little wolfish you got to listen to that did you get that it sounds a little wolfish and you start looking at these sheep that you start to trust. You go, my, what big ears you have. And my, what big eyes you have. And my, what big teeth you have. Because they're really wolves back behind there. Now, why would anybody want to fake dress like a sheep? It seems to me that they want those narrow road benefits somehow, but they don't want to take the narrow road path that gets you there. And so, and so they kind of fake it and make themselves look like it. We have this, if you'll notice verse 16, he says, you've got to look at the fruit. What kind of fruit do they produce? If it's a godly influence, they will produce godly people. They will influence people in a godly way. Not only the kind of fruit, but the quality of fruit in verses 16 and 17. Look at that fruit. It can't be shallow and weak and lacking in substance. You gotta, they've got to be producing fruit that actually has some depth to it and some maturity. If you recall, when Paul was preaching the, the, the people at Berea, they were all going, mm, we're not so sure, Paul. Come back tomorrow. We're going to study this out. And they get their Old Testaments out, and they're going to make sure that Paul knows what he's talking about. Did that offend Paul in any way? Do you think he was offended? He wasn't offended. It was almost like he was honored. Yeah, go ahead. I've got nothing to hide. Go ahead and do the searching. And hey, listen, when you have a preacher preaching me or anybody else, make sure you discern because we can be fake. The Christian faith is so easily fakeable. Look at the TV anytime you want to. It's a fakeable faith that I can convince you very easily by my words and actions that, that I look real, but I'm not. So go ahead and do that testing. We do that in another area, too. When you're going to choose elders, one of the tests of an elder is look at his children. Now, this is a sobering thought for us men, but it's a truth. The elders, when you choose one to become an elder, 
You need to look at his entire family. Now, why is that? And the scriptures tell us if he doesn't know how to manage his household, how can he manage God's household? If the children produced out of years under his tutelage and in his training are not spiritually depth, have some spiritual depth and maturity, then why in the world would you trust him with your people at church? It's a good question. The people you influence, what kind of influence do you have? But he's saying you've got to, when you choose the narrow way, you've got to evaluate everybody's influence on you and make sure it's a legitimate thing. But it's not just everybody else. The last paragraph is about us and about our friends at church. Can I tell you, just because somebody teaches a Bible class at Valley View doesn't mean they're teaching the right thing. You need to be evaluating what they're saying. And if they're a really good teacher, they don't mind you doing so. Go ahead and check up on me. That's okay. But then also evaluate your own life and the friends that you have. Just because somebody at church goes to church every Sunday doesn't mean they're a good influence for your kids doesn't mean they're a good example for you and a precedent set by a church member is not a good argument for your kids on you that's the truth and notice he says not everyone who says lord lord will enter the kingdom of heaven there's some people going to come and they're going to say god we have done great miracles in your name we've healed people in your name and he says i don't know who you are he doesn't deny they did it he just says i don't know who you are i find this really funny how can someone do a mir miraculous thing like that and not be known by god how can god give them the ability to do these miracles and not know that and not know them how can that be and the question the answer has to be this there are other ways you can do this. There are other ways you can produce this kind of result. And there are ways that you can do some great things for the kingdom, but your daily walk with God has nothing to do with sincerity and truth at all. You do some public things, you come to church on Sundays, but your daily life is a wreck spiritually. God says, I'm not judging you based on your high moments. I'm ju judging you based on your walk. What this means is the Christian life is more than just talk and verbal confessions. It's not just about words you say. It's not about songs that you sing. It's not being able to convince people that you use the word preacher rather than pastor and so you're spiritual. It's not that. We used to have people that would go across country, and I'm sure they still do, and they, they, they made this trek every two or three years, and they would come through, and they'd ask churches for money along the way, and they would figure out over the years which churches would be willing to give and which ones weren't, and they'd keep making appearances, and in Kennet, they would come through, and why in the world would they stop in Kennet if you're going across country? How would you even find it? And then how would you find Slicer Street Church of Christ building? Well, somehow the word gets around and these people started coming through. Well, I was there for a long time. And so this one guy kept coming through. He was from Wisconsin going down to Texas. Why? I don't know. But he comes to our building. He came once when I first got there. He came again and again. Fifteen years later, he's making his third or fourth trip. And he walks in the door thinking there'll be a new preacher he can fool. And I call him by name. I remember you and he just like whoops and I begin to have a conversation with him and he knows which group he's with when he steps into a Methodist church he asks for the 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 the, 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 the uh, priest or whatever that is he knows the words but when he comes in a church of Christ building he knows to call me preacher to ask for an elder and to put down instruments that's what he knows and so he does it because he knows the jargon there are people who know the Christian jargon but they're but they are just mouth deep it's not enough just to stand before a group of people and say yes Jesus is Lord I believe it that's great but let me ask you is your daily walk reflect that are you walking this every day when nobody's looking the Christian faith is more than verbals and the Christian life is more than just a public performance of faith. You may have helped with VBS a few years ago. You may have done two or three great things and then you sit back and your life is every bit as immoral as it was before you became a Christian. And if that's the case, you're not going to be judged and sent to heaven because you've done three great VBSs over the last 20 years. You're going to be judged based on your everyday walk performance. And whether you really trusted Christ or not. Let me give you an example from Acts 19. This is weird. 
that some itinerant Jewish exorcist undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. These people thought, we watched Jesus cast them out in his name. So what we're going to do, these Jewish exorcists, like, we're going to use Jesus' name and we're going to cast out demons. And it works a few times, but then you get to this one particular demon and they say, by the name of Jesus, come out. Well, these guys were using Jesus' name, but they weren't walking in Jesus' lordship. And because of that, notice what the evil spirit, the evil spirit answered and said, you know what? We know Jesus and we recognize Paul, but who in the world are you? And the evil spirits jump out of the guy, beat this guy to these exorcists to a pulp, and they run away naked. Isn't that a great story? That should be a VBS story for sure. <laughs> When you try to use the name of Jesus, but you don't know Jesus, it's going to beat you in the end. This is an invitation, y'all. He's moving in for the, the invitation to give a chance for people to respond. And he says, guys, you've got to walk the narrow road and you've got to evaluate the influences of your life. And you've even got to look at your own life and see how real you really are. Makes you want to come forward and join that march, doesn't it? Why in the world would anybody hearing, a hearing an invitation like that ever respond? What makes you want to jump out and say, I want to be part of that kingdom, Jesus? You've given me every reason not to. Why would anyone want to choose the Christian life based on that? And there's only one answer I can think of from this text. It's where you want to end up. People can complain, why is there only one way? Why is Jesus the only, why is there only one way? And why is that way narrow? Is it because God is rude and obnoxious and exclusive? Well, it could be. I guess God could be being rude by saying, well, I'm only going to let there be one way. Or maybe God is telling the truth. Maybe God is saying there's only one way to get to where you want to go, and that's to end up at real life. And there's only one way. And if I tell you there's many ways, and you take those ways, and it leads you away from life, I'm a cruel dictator. I'm somebody who's just lied to you to make you feel good about the journey, but you end up in the wrong place. God's telling the truth and he's loving you enough to tell you the truth if you want the life where sin no longer reigns and where everything is right and we live forever in peace and harmony with God. If you want that, there's only one way to get there. Here's how this would work. Let's say you want to go to Disney World. I got to tell you, it's a long road down there or an expensive flight down there for you, your kids and all that, right? It's going to be a lot of money. It's going to be a lot of time. It's going to be a lot of driving. And you don't like that. You don't like that? That doesn't sound comfortable to you. And so you start asking around. There's another guy. Well, I'll tell you what. It's just a few miles this way. Put 20 bucks in your pocket and you go down this way. Oh, wow. You're so nice. And you think you're so good. I just You're so friendly and so sincere and so warm. We're going to follow your path. And it takes you to Wiener, Arkansas, where there's a pool with a slide on it. <laughs> It's cheaper, it's easier to get to, it's an easier, clearer road. But listen, do you want Disney World or do you want Wiener? <laughs> Which road do you really want? A guy comes and he's, he's passed a Paragould, he's looking for Crowley's Ridge College. He passes Paragould from coming in from Poplar Bluff. And he comes to Jonesboro and he's at NEA Hospital and he's in the parking lot. And he says, hey, could you give me directions to where CRC is? Yeah, you've got to go back. You've come too far. You've got to go back about 15 miles and then make a left. You're telling me I wasted this gas and this time and I got to go back? Well, I'm telling you, if you want to get to CRC, you got to go back and go this way. I don't want to. I don't like that. I've wasted too much time. Over. Listen, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not telling you what to, I'm saying. If you want to be at CRC, you've got to go back. And people think, well, you could be nicer. You could give them an easier way. No, not if they're wanting to get to CRC. Yeah, I've got dreams, my eyes set on Yellowstone. I want that vacation one day because I want to see Old Faithful and so many other things. But you know what's prevented me so far? Four days in a car with two kids and nothing to do. <laughs> I can't think of a more... I just... 
Gece gece. You touched me. I'm waiting until they're 25. I get. I don't. I, I just. In order to get there, you have to. Oh, I can't imagine, and it makes me cringe. And I say, I just can't pull the trigger on going because of what you have to pay to get there. But you know what? One of these days I'm going to go. One of these days I'm going to suck that up and I'm going to save up and I'm going to go because this is the truth. There's only one way to see old faithful. There's only one way to get there and see it, and that's to pay the consequences of whatever it takes to get there, and you've got to endure and you go. And one of these days I will because there's only one day to get there. And I'm telling you guys, if you want to end up where God is and you want to be eternity with Him, there is one way you can go, and God is being loving and gracious to say, don't take that road. It won't lead there. I'm not trying to be exclusive, and I'm not trying to make you angry or work harder. I'm telling you, if you want life, this is the only way. It's called God telling the truth. I wrote this story for Becky Mulholland. I'll tell it to you. Imagine a man in love and wants to make an impression on his beloved by having a great meal and a, a night of line dancing. They've been in line dancing lessons for weeks. It's come to try it out. He does his research and there's this backwoods place out in the boonies, right? Has a great steak and a fun time of line dancing. So he prepares her for this night. He's in his tight Wrangler jeans with that circle worn in his back pocket from carrying his pitch pipe. <laughs> She's in her dress that has this flare in it that flows out when she spins as she dances. And he's got his truck all cleaned up and he waxes it and it looks like it was brand new. He picks her up and he, and he lifts her up in the truck. You know, it's really high. <laughs> she sits right up next to him because he's taken the incomplete console out. He's taken that whole thing out. And there's very little space, just enough for a Bible slid sideways, in between them as they travel. <laughs> They go through town toward this wonderful destination that they've dreamed about for weeks. Five miles short of the place, the pavement turns to gravel. He has worked so hard in this precious baby of a truck. The dust is going to mess up the wash and the wax. The bumps will get gravel up in his wheels and do damage and probably chip his windshield. And he stops and he thinks about it carefully. She thinks that he's thinking up the most romantic response and maybe bring out flowers. He shifts in reverse and takes her to the most overdressed dinner at Burger King in the history of the world. He wants to go there. He just won't take the inconvenience and cost to get there. There's too many people in this world who are wanting the narrow road destination. They just don't want the narrow road restriction. It's impossible and you have to just, you get to a point where you just have to choose. There's all sorts of reasons why the Christian life is hard. It's challenging. It's a lot freer. It's a lot, it's a lot easier over there on the wide road. And it really is. I think Christians need to admit that to people. It is easier over there. It is freer. There are more options. There are more things to do over there. But this is the road that leads to life. And you must decide for yourself once and for all, the one thing I want above everything else is not ease, is not convenience. I want life. I'll settle for nothing less than no more misery, no more emergency rooms, no more ERs, no more health, no more death, no more sickness, no more separations. That alone has to drive everything that you do. And once you decide that eternity is worth everything, the road is an easy choice. I choose vacation spots not based on the highways it's going to take to get there. I choose vacation spots based on where I want to be. The same needs to be for this decision that you make. Choose life. And if you choose life, here's your invitation. Enter by the narrow gate and walk the narrow way.
break my heart, dear Lord. Ten 